Hello and welcome to part one of using Blender 2.8. In this video, we're gonna be going over everything you need to know to start using this brand new version of Blender, Blender 2.8, which just came out this morning. If you're brand new to Blender, well, this is the video for you because in this video and this continuing video series, we're gonna be covering a whole bunch of topics, including 3D modeling, lighting, animation, visual effects, rigging for 3D characters, character animation, you name it, we'll be doing it in this tutorial series. If you're new to my channel, my name is Colin. I'm a YouTuber. I'm also a computer science and media high school teacher. And for the last 14 years, I've been a computer summer camp leader teaching Blender for about 11 of those years. Uh, that's enough about me. Let's go ahead and jump into Blender 2.8. Of course, if you like this video or if you learned something, go ahead and click on that like button below this video. It really helps me and my channel out. And if you want to see more videos like this one in Blender 2.8 and other technology, click on that subscribe button as well and click on the bell icon to get notified whenever I upload a new tutorial. So Blender 2.8, if you're not aware, Blender is a free and open source program that you can get from a few places, including www.blender.org. That's the best and easiest place to get it. Blender is available for Windows, Mac, and Linux operating systems. So pretty much just about any computer. You have to have a computer that came out since about 2012 or 2013. And that's because of the OpenGL. That's the graphics library support of your video card in your computer uh, that only was supported after about 2012 or 2013 or so. But other than that, you should be good. You can also get Blender from Steam and the Microsoft Store. So there's lots of places you can find it and install it from. It's easy. Let's go ahead and jump in. When Blender first launches, it looks fairly intimidating. There's lots of sections to the screen. There's lots of buttons and menus and panels uh, and everything looks really small on my screen. I'll be fixing that in a few minutes, but let's just go ahead and zoom in on that friendly splash screen. For each new version of Blender, we get a new splash screen. And this new splash screen is based on the Blender Animation Studios uh, latest open movie called Spring. And if you haven't seen Spring, I'll put a link to that short animation down in the description area below this video on YouTube, but below the splash screen are some quick setup settings in case you want to fine tune Blender right away. First off, shortcuts. If you're used to Blender 2.79, the last major version of Blender, you can switch from using the new shortcuts to the old shortcuts, or you can install shortcuts for other pieces of software like 3D Studio Max or Maya or other software like that if you're used to that and you want to stick with the same shortcuts that you already know. Now, Blender forever up until this major release has selected with the right mouse button on your mouse, of course, but we've just switched over to the left left uh, mouse button to select objects in your 3D scene. And that's weird for some users. So if you're used to old versions of Blender, you can switch over to that uh, the old way right away. But for this entire video series, I'm gonna be using left click because that's the default. Also, the space bar now by default is the play feature for an animation. If you wanna switch that over to something else, you can do that. And as of this date, there are only two themes for Blender, Blender Dark and Blender Light. I'm gonna stick with Blender Dark. You can also customize that to your heart's content in Blender's user preferences. Let's go ahead and jump into Blender. To close the splash screen, you just have to click on it. So click. So I've gone ahead and I've made Blender's user interface larger so you can see it on your screen on YouTube. Uh, there are lots of different parts of the screen in Blender and these different sections are called editors. Now, this might all be quite confusing to you if you're new to Blender. So let's go ahead and let's take this user interface and let's break it apart and break it down one by one. Along the top is Blender's top bar, which actually most of the time just stays where it is. It has the file and edit menu and render menu and this is where you can also change between different workspaces using tabs along the top we'll talk more about that a little bit later below the top bar is blender's main editor uh, we're going to cover that last actually this is called the 3d view editor again we'll come back to that on the right side of the screen there are two editors on the top is the outliner editor and this is where you can see and also hide by clicking those little eyeballs on the right hand side all the objects that are in 
in your scene. By default in Blender, you get three objects in your scene. You get a camera, a cube, and a light. And yes, you can delete any of those objects and add as many objects as you like. You might not use the outliner editor a whole lot, but trust me, it is handy once your scenes become more complicated as you get more familiar with Blender. Below the outliner editor is the properties editor, and this is a kind of a funny editor because it has tabs on the side. And as you click on these tabs, you'll see different sections and hopefully you can get an idea of what these different tabs are for, or you will throughout this uh, video and this video series. But these are for the settings for objects in your scene, as well as how you're going to actually output uh, your finished model or scene or animation and the actual settings for your scene. Materials are also here. Um, constraints are also here for linking multiple objects together. Your world settings are under a little globe. So this is called the properties editor. At the very bottom of the screen, there is an information bar, which is pretty easy to miss, but it's really handy because it tells you a bunch of information about your scene, including what collection you're in. That basically means what group you're in, what object you have selected, how many vertices are in your object or in your scene, how many polygons called faces, how many tries, how many objects are in your scene. And on the left side of this information bar are things that you can currently do with your mouse in the 3D viewport. We'll get into that more later. A little bit above that is the timeline or the timeline editor. And this allows you to make changes to objects. In other words, it allows you to animate over time and press play or play backwards and pause and change your start and end time of your animation and press this record button in order to make new keyframes in an animation. We'll be getting into animation in one of the very next videos in this series. And last but not least is the main 3D view editor. And we're gonna spend most of our time in this video in this editor window. But this is where Blender becomes a very powerful and customizable professional tool because this interface Face, as we have just described, can be customized to your heart's content in terms of its overall layout and its functionality. Remember those little tabs along the top? These are called workspaces and they are different pre-installed layouts for different editors on your screen. So the default layout uh, is actually called layout and this is for laying out basic objects in your 3D scene. Once you've done that, you're probably gonna to wanna to progress onto modeling. And when you click on this top tab, you can see that your arrangement of editors on your screen changes. And in fact, it brought us into what's called edit mode of this selected object, the cube, which we can then start 3D modeling. If you're done modeling and you wanna go into sculpting, well, you can jump into sculpting. And again, things change, but this is the same cube in all three layouts that we've already seen so far. Once you've finished sculpting, you can go into UV editing, which means putting textures and image textures onto objects. There's a layout or a workspace for texture painting, shading, animation, rendering, compositing, and scripting. And by the way, these different names correspond with the general workflow of creating a short 3D cartoon animation. So uh, there you go. But we're gonna stick again with layout, at least in this first tutorial, but also know that you can customize your interface uh, without using these tabs by grabbing the corner. If you put your mouse over the corner, either the top right or the bottom left of any of these editors on your screen, if you put your mouse in a corner, you can see your little mouse cursor changes to a little cross or a plus. Well, if you put your mouse in that area and then you left click and drag down, you can split your window into two. Or if you put your mouse in that same little area and drag to the left, if you're in the top right, click and drag to the left, you can split your window into two uh, left and right. If you wanna merge windows together, you can just do the opposite. You can click in that little area next to another window and you can click and drag into the next window over and then it'll give you an arrow, I'm still holding down, and you can decide which way you wanna go. You can also change any editor type to any other editor type. So I have two 3D viewports here, but I could make this window or editor into any other kind of editor that Blender has right up on the Windows header with this button right here, which lets me change the editor type. So if I wanna change into, let's say, a shader editor for editing the materials of that object that I have selected, well, this is a shader editor and this is more advanced for this video. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna merge these two windows 
together. Now I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. Let's talk about actually navigating and working in this 3D environment, the 3D editor or 3D viewport window, I might call it. At the top right of this editor, we have some new controls of under 2.8, including this new set of Cartesian axes. And if you put your mouse in this area and you click and hold, you can see that it spins your view around. Now this is called orbiting and orbiting can also be done if you have a mouse and if your mouse has a wheel on it like a wheel mouse you can press and hold your mouse wheel down like a button and then you can move your mouse around and this also allows you to orbit this is how you've always done it in blender before but you can now click on this little gizmo that's what it's called and just click and drag around to see around if you want to zoom in and out on your scene that can be done with this little plus button if you click on this plus and hold and then drag up and down, you can now zoom in and out. Of course, if you have a mouse with a mouse wheel, you can scroll up and down as well, that might be easier. And lastly, if you wanna see left and right from where you're currently looking, or above or below where you're currently looking, you can click and hold this little hand and it will let you do what's called pan your view around. Again, either left or right or up and down. And again, if you don't wanna use these little buttons, you can hold shift along with your middle mouse button like orbiting and you can do this with shift and uh, orbiting as well. Now, one of the things you'll commonly wanna do is look at your scene from the perfect front or top or left or right or side, in other words, view. The way you can do that in Blender 2.8 now is by putting your mouse over these little axes, this gizmo up here, and clicking on one of the circles. So if I click on the Y little circle, you'll see it jumps me to my back orthographic view. This means that I'm looking at my scene straight on from the back view. If I click on the little Y again, I can switch to the front orthographic view. If I switch to the, uh, the X little button, I'm going to the right, and if I click on it again, I'll go to the left, and of course, if I click on Z, it'll go to the top, and again, bottom. And if I wanna to switch to look through my camera, that other object in my scene, well, I'm upside down here, uh, this one right here is my camera, I can click on this button right there, and that'll take me into the camera, and then I can click on it again to jump me back out of the camera. But of course, being Blender, there are lots of keyboard shortcuts to do all these things. If I press the till key on my keyboard, yeah, that's the little squiggly key on the top left of your keyboard, it'll bring up, if my mouse is in the 3D editor window, it'll bring up what's called a pie menu where I can select from any of my available views. So top, bottom, left and right, back and front. I can view through my camera here. I can also zoom in to whatever I have selected. So if I wanna see from the front view, I can just click on front. And this pie menu is really handy because if I click on that little tilde key, I can quickly swipe in one of those directions once I'm used to it. And I can go, let's say, into my back view if I quickly swipe up and to the right. And if I swipe after I press tilde to the left, I can go to the left view or if I press it again and go to the right view or down to the bottom or up to go to the top view or where's front, it's at the top left. I can go back to my front view. Also, if you have an extended keyboard on your computer, like you have a number pad at the right side of your keyboard, you can press the number keys to get around to your different views as well. You can press the one key to go to your front view. This is the one key only on your numpad, not on your top number row. If you press three, you can go to your right view. If you press seven, you can go to your top view. So lots of ways to see your scene from different angles. And also remember if we press one or three or seven, it switched us into this orthographic view, which is more flat. And if we orbit, it goes back into perspective view, which is more 3D and has depth. Well, you can toggle between those two modes, no matter which angle you're looking at your scene from, using this button up here. It's called switch the current view from perspective orthographic projection. And it's also the number five key on your number pad. So if you press this, it'll switch into orthographic, which is more flat, or again, into perspective, which is more in 3D, which again, is the five key on your numpad. Now Blender 2.8 has four different ways you can look at your scene in this viewport. Right now we're in what's called solid view and this corresponds with these four buttons at the top right on the header of this 3D editor window. So solid view is this one. If you click on the next one to the left you go into what's called wireframe view. 
it's named appropriately. Everything displays as a wire or wireframe. If you go one to the right or the third option, this is called the look dev mode. It's new to Blender 2.8 and basically it lets you see all the materials or all the objects with materials in your scene. So all the colors you've added and image textures and things like that without all of the fancy final lighting and shadows and shading. Although it does have some kind of light uh, and environment projecting onto your objects in kind of a neat way so you can see approximately how your scene will look in the end. And last but not least, the fourth option is rendered view. And this is a new feature to Blender 2.8, at least in its implementation, because Blender 2.8 uses its new EV render engine, uh, which is how it draws your frames out to render in real time. And this is a lot like a game engine, it happens really, really fast. And now Blender has it and it's quite amazing because you can see exactly what your scene will look like in the EV render engine right in your screen in real time and you can orbit around and change your view and it all just stays rendered. It's amazing. You can also hide the things on your screen like the grid floor and any gizmos you might have on your screen to move things around and you can do that by clicking these two buttons. Uh, this one right here hides all the extras on your scene so if you want to see what looks like rendered without anything in the way you can just turn off all of your extras and if you click this little button it'll turn off all the gizmos on your screen including those top little buttons and the axes uh, but again you can turn them back on you can also customize anything on your screen uh, under these two menus including all your gizmo settings and all the viewport overlays that's what they're called on the left side of the 3d editor window you have your toolbar with common tools you'll need to transform an object in your scene and to select Select objects. The very first tool in the toolbar is the selection tools. And if you click on hold on these, you can see the different options. You've got select, select box, select with a circle like you're painting, and selecting with a lasso. And the way you can get to this is you can press the W key on your keyboard, which will cycle through all of those options. So if you press W, you'll get to the circle select. Uh, the lasso tool, which you lets you select different objects in your scene. Uh, w again gets to the normal select uh, tool, and W again will get to the box select tool. And these are active tools, so as long as you have one selected, uh, it will remain the active tool, which is a change from older versions of Blender. Next up, we have the 3D cursor tool. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Then we have the move tool, which lets you move a selected object. So if I select the camera, we get the move gizmo. Uh, on that object coming off of that object's origin and if I select my cube you can see I can now move my cube around. I recommend that when you're grabbing a hold of these gizmos that you grab the end, the tips of the arrows and not somewhere in this round circle because you don't know exactly how you're moving this. I am not moving this up and down uh, absolutely right now. I'm moving it kind of diagonally right now so I recommend that you grab the tips of the arrows and of course you can press Control Z to undo. The next one is the rotate tool, which lets you control the rotation of an object that you have selected uh, with these little hula hoop gizmos. And if you grab one, you can rotate it and you can even see uh, how much you're rotating. Uh, up on the top left there, you'll see when I'm rotating how many degrees I've rotated that object, which is really handy. I'll undo a few times. And the third tool in this section is the scale tool, which lets you uh, scale an object. And of course, you can, with any of these tools, uh, or at least move and scale, you can move or scale on two of the axes without affecting the third axis, okay? So you can scale with this one on the Z and the uh, Y without affecting the X axis with this one right there, okay? The fourth tool in this section is the all around transform tool, which gives you move and rotate and scale all in one gizmo. If you have an object selected like the camera or the lamp or the cube and you press either the X key on your keyboard or the delete key, which is not the same as the backspace key on many computers, uh, if you press that key, the X or delete, you will get a dialog box to confirm that you want to delete that object. So I'll press delete. I've gotten rid of my cube. If I want to add a new object, I can go up to the add menu and most of the objects you're going to want to add are meshes. So there are plain meshes, which are 
flat squares. If I want to move that around, I can now do that with either my move tool or the transform tool. So I'll move that off to the side. If I go up to the add and menu and mesh, I can select cube as well. That's how I can get a cube, but there are lots of primitive, simple 3D objects you can add. There's a torus, which is like a donut. Uh, if I go to add mesh, I can add a monkey head. If you're not familiar with this, this is Suzanne the monkey. It's a primitive object that's a bit more complicated. That's always come with every version of Blender I've ever used. Uh, when you add an object into a scene in Blender, there's a couple of things that you need to be aware of. First is where the object gets put. If I move this monkey head and I go to add mesh over I don't know, a cylinder, it gets put in my 3D scene at the coordinates of this little 3D cursor, which looks like a little crosshair from a gun. It's a white and gray and black, but I can move that around. If I select my cursor tool, that's now the active tool, I can click anywhere in my scene and that's where new objects will get put. So if I go up to add mesh, uh, UV sphere, uh, that's where the UV sphere just got put in my scene. If I hold shift and I right click anywhere in my scene, that will also move the 3D cursor. This is a change from previous versions of Blender where you would just left click to put the 3D cursor anywhere you wanted. Now you hold shift and you right click to place it. If you want to put that 3D cursor back to the middle of your scene, in other words, coordinates 0, 0, 0, uh, you can press shift S on your keyboard Shift S will bring up the snap pie menu and you can say cursor to world origin. Okay, that's Shift S and then cursor to world origin. There you go. The second thing you should be aware of is that when you first add a mesh to your scene, in other words, if I go up to add mesh, um, let's do a cylinder, you can change the basic properties of that primitive mesh in this little popover menu that comes up at the bottom. It's very unintrusive, but before I move this object or rotate it or scale it or select anything else. If I go down to add cylinder, I can change the number of vertices. That means the number of little points around the circle at the top and bottom to make the cylinder more detailed or less detailed. So if I click and drag in there, I can make the cylinder much less detailed or conversely, I can drag the other way and make it have many, many, many more sides around the outside. I can click in here and type a number like 50 and press enter and that's how many sides it will have and I can change the radius here, the depth which is the height, um, how the top and bottom are filled which we'll get into uh, in a future video uh, as well as its location in our world so you can really affect a lot about the object you're adding down here. Now if I were to select something else in my scene by going up to the selection tool and then clicking on something else, that little section would disappear and I would no longer, even if I went back and selected the object I just added, I would not be able to get back to that section. As you can see, it's gone right now because I selected something else. If I were to move this, this cylinder and then go up to add mesh um, UV sphere. I could change the segments in that object to make it more complicated or less complicated. UV spheres have segments which go around and rings which go up and down, kind of like lines of longitude and latitude uh, on the earth. Uh, I can change the radius, but as soon as I select using the selection tool something else, that section goes away. Speaking of transforming objects, in other words, moving and rotating and scaling objects, there are keyboard shortcuts that'll make moving and rotating and scaling objects really much, much faster in Blender. If you leave your selection tool enabled, but if you press one of three keyboard shortcuts, G, R and S. Those keyboard shortcuts allow you to transform your objects really, really quickly without having to move your mouse and select a different tool from the toolbar. In other words, if I select my plane in my scene and I tap S on my keyboard and then let go and then move my mouse, you can see I'm able to make this ground proportionally scaled larger, as large as I want. And you'll notice that when your mouse cursor goes off the side of one side of the viewport, it comes on the other side so you can keep going forever to make it as large or as small as you want. So I'm going to leave it right about there. If I click, I can confirm that, that transformation. And if I tap G now, I can move or grab this object in my scene. Now, for all three of these keyboard shortcuts, G for grab, R for rotate, S for scale, I recommend that you do these from your different orthographic views, front, side, top, left, right, bottom, 
etc. So if I press escape on my keyboard, I can undo my current transformation. And if I press the tilde key on my keyboard, I can go to one of my views. I'm gonna to go to the top view. And now I might switch over into my other viewport shading mode. So I'm gonna press the Z key on my keyboard. I don't think I mentioned that before. The Z key brings up a pie menu with the four different view modes of your viewport, which align with these four buttons up here. So I'm gonna go into solid view just so I can see things easier. And now I can select different objects. If I tap G with the UV sphere selected, I can grab it and move it around. And because I'm looking at this from the top view, I'm not afraid that I'm accidentally moving this UV sphere up and down. Likewise, if I go to my front view with the tilde key and then front, I can tap G and now I'm aware that I'm not moving this UV sphere forward and backward on the Y axis, which is the axis pointing uh, towards me and away from me. If I tap G from the front view, I can only move it on the X and Z axes. Likewise, these three transformation keyboard shortcuts G, R, and S have modifier keys that you can use after you press G, R, or S. If I press G with this UV sphere selected, of course I can move it right now left, right on the X axis or up and down on the Z axis. But if I wanna only move this UV sphere up and down, after I press G, I can tap Z on my keyboard and that constrains my movement or the transformation to the Z axis. If I now tap a number like five, and then press enter, I've just moved my UV sphere up by five units on my screen. So I'll do that again. I'm gonna tap G on my keyboard to grab. I'll tap this time X, and now I can move only on the X axis. But now if I type a number like negative three, and press enter, I know exactly how I've moved that object. This works with rotation and scaling as well. So if I select my monkey head and I tap S to scale, of course I can make my monkey head bigger or smaller. But if I tap five, I've just made the monkey head five times bigger and I could press enter. That's great, but I'm gonna undo that and I'm gonna tap S again. But this time I'm gonna constrain scaling to the Z axis. So S to scale, Z, for the Z axis, and now I can scale only up and down, and now I'll press one zero for 10, and press enter, and now I have a ridiculously squashed or stretched uh, monkey head. I'll press Control Z to undo that. Likewise, if you wanna rotate an object, you can control the degrees of rotation. If I select this uh, cube, and I tap R on my keyboard. Of course, I'm rotating now in some funny direction because I'm looking at my scene from a user view. That means just a random rotation of my uh, viewport's camera. So if I tap R right now, I can't really say how I'm rotating it a little bit on the X, a little bit on the Y, a little bit on the Z axis. But now if I tap uh, Z on my keyboard, I know because I tapped R and then Z that I'm rotating this cube only around the Z axis. If I now tap uh, let's say 45 and press enter, well I know that I've rotated that cube 45 degrees on the Z axis. If I wanna clear either the scale or the rotation or the translation of an object, since I've moved it or rotated or scaled it, I can tap Alt and then any one of those keyboard shortcuts, G, R, or S on my keyboard. So if I tap Alt, R, on my keyboard, the keyboard shortcut, it undoes the rotation that I've done to that object. If I tap Alt S on my keyboard, it'll undo any scaling. I hadn't scaled that cube. And if I tap Alt G on that keyboard, the cube will go back to where it was first added into my scene. Just a note that there are more tools on the tool shelf that I'm not gonna be talking about in this video. You have the annotate tool and the measure tool. Uh, and if you go into other workspaces or other modes, like from object mode into edit mode or sculpt mode of a mesh, you will get different options or tools on your toolbar. If I go up to modeling, you'll see that because I'm now in edit mode of a cube mesh, I have a lot more tools at my disposal that are only available in edit mode, but we will get to those in future videos. A good challenge for new Blender users that I challenge you to pause the video now and try for yourself is to make a snowman out of primitive 3D shapes in Blender. I've gone ahead and gone up to file and new and general. That's how you can create a new Blender file as it comes up by default. So when you first get a new scene, the 3D cursor where new objects get put is in the middle of your scene. If I go up to the add menu, which by the way has a keyboard shortcut, it's shift A on your keyboard 
it's a handy one to have. By the way, I'm gonna put a list of all the keyboard shortcuts I mentioned in this video in the description area below this video on YouTube, as well as chapter length, the topics of things I talked about in this video, again, down below this video on YouTube. If I bring up the add menu with shift A on my keyboard, and I add, let's say, a UV sphere, I get the first ball in my snowman. If I wanna duplicate an object, there's a keyboard shortcut for that too, although I could just right click on that object, that's a new option in Blender to bring up what's called the object context menu. If I have different objects selected, if I right click, I get different options depending on the context of what I have selected. So if I have a camera selected, I can do things with that camera that I could not do with a mesh. But with a mesh selected, or really anything, if I right click, I can say duplicate objects. And the keyboard shortcut for that is Shift D. So I'm gonna duplicate the UV sphere that I've added, right click, duplicate object, and I get a copy of it and it's automatically grabbed with my mouse cursor moving it around. Of course, I can move it up. I could tap Z to move it straight up from its original version and click to put it in place. And now if I tap S to scale, I can scale that one down a little bit and click. If I want to duplicate, I could press Shift D. That was the keyboard shortcut. Or you could just use your normal keyboard shortcuts for copy and paste. Control C, Control V. And now you get a copy, which is in the same place. And I can tap G to grab the copy and I can tap Z to move it up and down, and then I can click and tap S to scale. So as you can see, you can create a simple snowman body fairly quickly. Of course, if I wanna add something like a carrot nose onto the face of my snowman, I might wanna add a cone off the side of the snowman's head, and then I might wanna rotate it and put it in the right position. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I'm gonna use my 3D cursor tool to place my 3D cursor right over here, and then I'm gonna add, so Shift A, a mesh cone. Now the cone is too big and the wrong shape. If I tap S on my keyboard, I can make it proportionally smaller. And what I really care about here is the size of the circle on the bottom because I can really easily now, once it's the right size, in other words, the diameter of the circle on the bottom of the cone, if I tap S and then Z on my keyboard, I can scale it up and down really easily. Or I could use the scale tool and then just move it that way by pulling on the blue Z axis handle. Now that I have the cone the right size and the right shape, I might want to rotate it so it's pointing at me, so out from the snowman's face. So to do that, I might go to my side view, and again, I can use this little gizmo up here, and I can click on the X to go to the side view. And so now this is the front of the snowman's face. I can tap R to rotate, and I might tap R and then 90 for 90, or rather I'll undo that R, then negative nine zero, and I'll press enter to rotate it precisely. I'll tap G to move it forward on the Y axis, and I'll go back to my front view, which I can go to via clicking on Y, and then I can tap G to move it uh, to the front of my snowman, and it's, well, you know what? I'm looking at my scene from the back. I'm gonna click again on the Y, to go to my front view. And now, as you can see, if I orbit around, I've got the uh, cone nose, carrot nose on the front of the snowman's head. So if I go back to my front view, again, I could do this in many ways. I could press the one key on my number pad. I could press the tilde key on my keyboard to bring up the pie menu and I could go to front. Uh, I might go and add a icosphere for eyeballs. So I'm gonna press shift A on my keyboard, add an icosphere tap S to scale that down, tap G to move it over to the I, tap three or tilde and then right to go to the side view. I can tap G to move it forward. And now if I go back to the front view, tilde and then uh, front, I can duplicate that eyeball. I might wanna move it a little bit. So I'll duplicate it now, right click, duplicate objects and move it over to the side. So as you can see, if I kept going, I could add buttons for the, made out of uh, icospheres or UV spheres. I could add more for melt pieces. I could 
make two cylinders into the tall and brim parts of a top hat, uh, and I could make as much detail as I want. One last thing in this snowman example, if I right click on a selected mesh, I can make it either shaded flat, which is how meshes are shaded by default, or I could shade them smooth, and that would kind of blend together all the shading uh, of all the different faces or polygons on a mesh. So I'll just go ahead and select both of the other UV spheres and shade them as smooth as well. And you know what, I'm gonna fast forward this part of the video, but I'm gonna go ahead and add more objects to my snowman in fast forward. <laughs> So now you can see I have a finished very simple snowman. Let's go ahead and add materials or colors to these mesh objects. To add materials to objects on Blender, you simply need to select one of the meshes and then over in the properties window, if you go to this little circle ball looking tab, this is the materials tab of the object in the properties editor. So now I, with a mesh selected, if I press new, that's how you simply add a new material to a selected mesh object. If you want to change the color, we're not going to go into too much detail here. All you have to do is click here in the colored color picker area of the base color and that will change the color of that object. So if I select uh, let's say a green color for the hat. I don't see it in this case because I'm looking at my view or my viewport is displaying in solid viewport shading mode. If I switch over to either look dev or render view, you'll see what it actually looks like and you'll see the actual color. I suggest using the third look dev viewport shading mode for this step. I would also suggest that you name your materials. That's done right here. If I click in this section, I can press backspace on my keyboard. I'm going to type hat uh, green and press enter. And if I want to reuse that material on another object, I can simply select that other object or mesh. And then instead of pressing new, I can press on a little thumbnail next to it, which brings up a drop down list of all the other materials in my scene. And I can simply reuse hat green. Do know though, that if you change the color of this hat green on the bottom brim part of the hat, it will also change the top color as well because it's referencing the same material. Let's go ahead and add a color to our snowball. So I'll select the head. Yes, it is appearing sort of white, but it does not have a material on it. And that is something that we want to fix. So I'll press new. I'm going to change the base color to a brighter color of white. If you want to make something look more shiny or more dull, uh, that's the roughness value. So if I don't want my, my snow to be shiny, I'll turn that roughness down. And by the way, there is a little preview section here where you can preview how the material will actually look. It might be a little bit slow in here, uh, but I believe it should work. So if I turn the roughness up or down, you should see it reflected up here. So roughness will get rid of the reflections on a... Uh, oh, pardon me, we have to turn the roughness up to make it dull and roughness down makes the object more reflective, okay? So this material has no roughness. Let's go ahead and add that very quickly to the rest of the snowballs and I'll really quickly in fast forward uh, add all the other colors to all the other objects. <music> All right, so I finished making my snowman. Here it is, it's done. I wanna render it out now to a finished image file that I can save to my computer and even post to social media if I like. Uh, if you wanna do this, you need to render out uh, in other words, make an image from this scene that you can save through the perspective of the camera. So if I click up here on the camera button, or if I press the tilde key and go to view camera, or if I press the zero key, there's lots of ways of getting to things in Blender, the zero key on my numpad, uh, it will switch me to my camera's view. Now I could select my camera if I break out of camera view by pressing the little camera button again. I could zoom out and I could select my camera and I could use the transform tool to move it uh, and rotate it, but there is a better way. If I go into my camera's view and I orbit, well, it'll actually break me out of the camera. It won't let me move the camera while I'm in it unless I actually go into the camera and then select, click on the edge of it, and then I could tap G to move it around, but again, there's a better way. 
There's a side panel on this side of the 3D view port. It's called the tool shelf. We've talked about it. If you press T, you can hide it, or T brings it up. It's the toolbar. There's another sidebar on the right side. It's the properties bar, properties panel. If you press N, that comes up. I'm not sure why it's N and not for properties, but hey, there you go. And there are tabs at the side. Now you will have three tabs. I have one extra one for this screencast keys display down here uh, on my screen. But under the third tab, view, if you check under view lock, lock camera to view, if you check this box, you will then be able to orbit and pan and zoom using your normal controls or even this gizmo uh, to move your camera around, okay? Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom out. I can use this one too if I want. I can orbit around to an angle that I like. I can pan around to put my snowman in the middle. And you know what? I'm going to press Shift A on my keyboard and add a mesh plane and then tap S to scale it up and then move it straight down so my snowman's kind of on the ground. Now, if I go up to the render menu and say render image, it will take my scene and it will draw it uh, into an image file. And it was really that quick. Yes, Blender has a new render engine. Rendering means to draw the 3D scene uh, into an image file, calculating uh, things like lights and shadows. A new render engine called Eevee. It stands for uh, Extra Easy Virtual Environment Engine, and it is a real-time render engine, very much like a game engine. But if you want to use one of the old render engines like Cycles, which is a higher quality but slower render engine, you can go over to the Properties window under the Camera tab, and you can change the render engines here. There are three by default in Blender 2.8. Eevee is the default. There's the Workbench engine for lower quality simple renders, and Cycles which is the higher quality, but again, slower render engine for more precise renders. So now with cycles, if I go up to render and render image, this will take significantly longer for any computer, but you will get better results by default. And in a future video, uh, we'll go over how to make EV renders look really, really good, almost as good as cycles. I'm gonna go ahead and speed up this part of the video as this image is rendering out. Okay, so this image took 30 seconds on my computer to render using the Cycles Render Engine with its default settings using my computer's CPU. If I wanna save this image, I need to go up to Image and Save or Save As. And if I select Save As, I'm confronted with this file dialog editor in Blender. Now, Blender's file uh, editor, what you see right now, is the way you save in Blender, and it really looks like it's from the 1990s. And it may change in future versions of Blender 2.8, but essentially what you need to do is navigate to where you wanna save to, in other words, the folder. In my case, I'm gonna click on my desktop, and I'm going to now, being in my desktop, which is what this top line says, give this image file a name. Untitled.png is not a good name. I'm gonna call this snowman-render, and I'll add a dot png just to be safe. If I wanna to navigate to a different drive, a hard drive on my computer, I could open up this volumes panel on the side, which brings up all the different hard drives and USB drives I have plugged in uh, to my computer, but I'll just leave this on my desktop. If you wanna change the image file type, you can do that right here, file format. PNG is an uncompressed still image file type. If you wanna save as a JPEG, you can go ahead and do that. In fact, I think that I might. If you wanna save now, you just press save as image. And now on my desktop, I should have that image right there, ready to share on social media if I like. Last up is saving. Saving is really simple in Blender. If I go up to the file menu and select save or save as, uh, I need to navigate to where on my computer I wanna save. In my case, I'm gonna go not to a volume, a hard drive on my computer. I'm gonna go to my desktop and that's where I am, this top bar E desktop is my desktop folder. The second line again is my file name. And when you save a Blender file to reopen and edit later in Blender, it ends with dot blend. But before that, I'm free to customize it. In fact, I can get rid of the dot blend as well. I'm gonna call this snowman001 and I'm not even gonna type the dot blend. It'll add that for me. If I click on save as Blender file, 
uh, it's saved. And up in the top bar, you can see exactly where this is saved, e desktop snowman 001blend If I make a change to this scene, so if I take my snowman hat and I go to the materials and I change the base color to say, oh, aqua color, uh, I've made a change. And up on this top bar, you'll see a star. This is common in other programs. It means this version of the file has not been saved. If I go up to file and save, uh, it's updated. So this has been an introduction to Blender 2.8, especially if you're new to Blender. I hope this helped you out. In the coming days and weeks and months and years, I'll be making more tutorials in this Blender 2.8 tutorial series. Uh, this tutorial is number one. And on the thumbnail of this video, in the top left, you'll see the number of the tutorial that it is. So this is number one. You do not need to watch these videos in order, but the numbers provide a reference for you on which number I'm currently on and how many videos in this tutorial series there are. In upcoming videos in this series, we're going to be talking about more basic principles of using Blender, including 3D modeling and using many of the modeling tools so you can create your own shapes. We'll be talking about animation and lighting and rendering. Before we get onto more advanced topics like character rigging, IK rigging, creating walk cycles for character animation, using particle effects to create things like snow and fire, and what the differences are between the Cycles Render Engine and the EV Render Engine, and yes, the Workbench Render Engine. We'll be going over as many things as I can think of in Blender 2.8. But thanks for watching. Of course, if you like this video or if you learned something, go ahead and click on that like button below this video. It really helps me and my channel out. Click on that subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this one in Blender 2.8 and click on the bell icon to get notified whenever I upload a new tutorial. Also check out my Facebook page at facebook.com slash borncg. On that page, I talk to you guys the most. That's where I do it uh, most there on my Facebook page. I post sneak peeks of what I'm working on next. So check me out there, but thanks for watching. See you next one, bye-bye.